How's it going, everybody? It's Robert and Austin with Gas Money. And on today's episode of Gas Money Mentions, we have our special guest, Griffin Lynch, who's the owner of Coast to Coast Detailing and Coatings. Uh, so basically, I met Griffin a couple weeks ago down here in Tallahassee, where I go to school. And we started talking, learned that he has a uh, mobile car detailing business and wanted to learn some more about it. So Griffin, first of all, thanks so much for coming on today. And if you want, go ahead and give us a little more better picture of what your business is today. And then we can go from there man thanks for having me i appreciate it um so yeah um i do mobile detailing i also do ceramic coatings paint correction a couple of other things that kind of go outside the revenue of what a regular detailer would do i guess um i started back in 2017 back in pensacola um i lost my job back then and i was needing a way to pay for school so i just kind of started my own detailing business it was the thing that i knew best back then and uh just kind of went with the flow and where it took me. I ended up coming out here to Tallahassee about a year after that, started the business again out here. I had a little more education under my belt. I studied entrepreneurship at Florida State. Um, well, I minored in entrepreneurship, <laughs> but um, yeah, it just gave me a much better basis for like what I should be doing, how I should be running my business, more of like the admin side, I guess you should say. And after that, just using my education, it really took me a lot further that time around. And here we are six years later. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And I guess the, the biggest thing of starting a new business, too, especially in such a, a niche market, um, just like getting into it. Did you work in any sort of detailing job beforehand or was this something you just kind of saw the side of the online? You were like, hey, I'll try it out. And like, how did you get into it at first? A little bit of both. Um, the, I actually had two jobs at the same time right before I was detailing. I worked um, at a church. I did like, it was janitorial stuff, but it, the way my boss was, it was more like detailing. And I just had a much more accurate education of like the chemistry that goes into cleaning and the necessity for that. Because there's a lot of people out here, not trying to throw shade, but there's a lot of people out here that clean houses, clean cars, clean anything. And they're not really using the right chemicals. They might give you a good end result at first, but they might be damaging the product that you're trying to clean. And it's not just about cleaning. It's about longevity. It's about protecting it. Those are the things that people don't really think about whenever they go with who they choose. Right, Especially when sure. you're working with more expensive cars too. And if I got the idea right, you're working with uh, kind of more of the high end cars, it seems like. I do whatever people pay me for. You know, I have my price. Yeah. And if the people who have a 99 Accord want to pay me to detail their 99 Accord, I'll gladly do it. But I definitely try to appeal more to the higher end audience just because that's where more of the care is. That's where more of the willingness to invest in something that's going to give you a long term result, like I was saying, is that. Yeah. And it sounds like you learned a lot from those original jobs, you know, with all the chemistry and, and everything that really goes into it. You obviously didn't have just the education that I have is just I'll, I'll spray some armor all on it and, and wipe it up and you're good, which I heard that's that's not really good. <laughs> I'm sure you, you frown upon that for sure. You use a lot of different stuff. But with that being said, was there any certifications or courses or extended education that you actually took or was it all just from your experience yeah absolutely so in 2018 i went and got certified for my first ceramic coating um the company that i got certified by is no longer even in existence but um it was the education that counts i guess right but i got certified they taught me how to apply it they taught me like the chemistry behind it it was really legit and that it was actually a little more straightforward and behind the scenes science than what a lot of the companies that are still around today will teach you a lot of today is just application based. They don't really teach you why it works, why this happens, that kind of thing. And it may not be important to the labor, but from a salesman standpoint, I find that information incredibly valuable. And I think that's more of where I appreciate my, pre my previous work experience because it taught me to have a much more refined uh, knowledge of the chemicals that I'm using and how that can affect what you're cleaning, I guess. But yeah, with that said, with the next question, um, just kind of relating how Austin and I started Gas Money. Um, back in the day, I mean, we were both in high school. We were really just looking for a way to make money on the side. And our method of doing that was getting a couple cheap lawnmowers, going out, knocking on people's doors. And at that time, we really didn't have any idea or any plans to grow it into what it is today, where it's that platform connecting young adults to homeowners. So 
I guess relating that to your story, uh, obviously you were pretty young when you started your business as well. When you first started out, I mean, you were kind of in between jobs. Did you see it as kind of growing it into a business eventually, or was it more of just a side hustle to make money that ended up growing farther than you thought? Great question. Yeah, it was definitely just a side hustle at first. Um, it, I didn't really invest much into it at the time, kind of like what y'all were saying. Y'all just got some equipment exactly what i did um one thing that i learned early on that i really liked and that i encourage any young business person or person striving to have a business to look into is the lean business model um i believed that i could just start out with just a bucket of water and a simple shop vac that i got donated and use that profit to just slowly buy what i needed and then make the profit and that's exactly what i did so i started with ten dollars and started my business and obviously that's a lot harder today than it was even just six or seven years ago. But anybody can do things like that. It's just how you pitch yourself to customers, how you sell yourself to customers. You know, you have to paint the right picture of what you're offering. If I was going out there and saying, I'm going to give you a five star detail with a bucket of water and a shot vacuum, I'd I'd, I'd call your bluff pretty fast. <laughs> exactly. And what was that like getting your first few clients? I'm sure it was a nerve wracking experience because that's how it was for us. Yeah, definitely. It was really weird trying to portray myself as a businessman when I definitely really wasn't back then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and how did how did that all start then? You know, uh, it sounds like you started it just as kind of that side hustle started um, the, the lean business approach. Like you were saying, that's exactly what we did. Uh, I mean, I, I think our first couple pieces of equipment were free. And mm. like, it sounds like you too, you know, you got donated the, the shop back and, um, and then we worked into with gas money with different services and things like that. But, um, I guess then through doing a couple client, you know, working with a couple clients and building your confidence, um, in the space and in the industry, how, like, like, give me the timeline where you were like, okay, I'm, I'm getting better at this. I'm getting good at this. And now I'm confident I can actually get into the luxury stuff because that has to hold a lot of confidence, right? Absolutely, man. And you know, I hate to say it, but it took me probably four to five years before I really was like, I want to go do luxury cars. And I don't feel like that was more from confidence. Maybe that was a big part of it, but I feel like it was more just from like, I was scared. I didn't know that. Well, I guess that is confidence. Okay. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> right. 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 Um, but yeah, I mean, early on, I just wanted to be the cheap guy. I just wanted people to book with me so that I knew, Hey, I'm going to have work two, three weeks from now. I'm not going to have to hunt for work. And I, I was fine with that for a number of years. But once I got to that point where I was ready to grow and ready to scale, that just really was not cutting it anymore. You know, there was no way for me to pay employees and still make a profit on that because what, what incentive do they have to not go start their own thing at that point? But I, I guess that's where the fear part came from is that I wasn't ready to risk not having a booked out schedule. I was always more comfortable charging cheaply so that I could have more people book with me. But I think after I got to that point, it was right around that COVID was really hitting um a lot of people had lost their jobs a lot of people were starting side hustles you know lawn care businesses detailing kind of just doing exactly what we did but and nothing wrong with that at all but when you've been in the industry for i think i was in it for three or four years at the time um you know you you really don't want to have to go back to competing with people who are starting from square one and thinking just like you did like oh 30 dollars details like oh man i'm trying to charge 200 no one's going to pay me that now and I think that's where the fear came from. So I always try to compete on their level instead of competing against them. Exactly. And I like that too, kind of going for those more quality jobs, it seems like over the quantity. And that just comes with becoming more comfortable in your craft. And Absolutely. one of those things too, we, we talk about all the time, especially in detailing and more like skilled labor is a lot of clients don't realize uh, they're not just paying for the service, but they're also paying for the years and years of accumulated skills you've been working on of different uh, learnings about different chemicals, learning how their car needs to be treated. And there's a lot of businesses out there that'll start out uh, with like a mobile detailing business, for example, and straight out the gate, try and go for the luxury cars, straight out the gate, try and charge high rates. And it's one of those things like you did where you have to kind of build up and be able to justify that. And I feel like that's what a lot of people miss, especially in businesses. It takes time 
and you got to be patient and be willing to kind of put in that work and learn your craft instead of just going out there and acting like you know what you're doing. So it, there, there's always got to be that balance, obviously. But I guess uh, I know you did mention employees. So that's one of the things we were going to ask about. So is it uh, sounds like you've got multiple people working for you or how is that kind of set up? Yeah. Um, so right now I have two employees in Tallahassee and I have one employee in Pensacola. I'm working on hiring another one out there. I really think that keeping a small circle is good for service-based businesses only to the point of necessity. You know, if you can manage doing all of those jobs and giving your crew enough work that they're not overworking, but they're also not underworked, keep it there. Cause those guys deserve to get paid. If you can give your guys 500 to a thousand dollars a week, depending on how much work they're doing, you know, um, you're doing a good job. My guys don't work more than 20 hours a week right now. And that's roughly what they're making and they're pretty happy there. And I think that's how you kind of incentivize your people to not go start their own thing and compete against you. You're investing in them to stay with you. Exactly. Yeah, Especially yeah. with that tight knit aspect. Cause that's what we preach all the time. It's better. And I'm sure it keeps the quality higher. It keeps that almost relationship feel going. Like with us and gas money, when we started out, it was all just this tight knit circle of friends that were working together. And obviously that had a lot more to do with it in terms of instilling that passion. Um, but as a business owner, I'm sure you could agree on this. Like the biggest thing you need to have is um, helping your employees or your contractors, whoever you're working with, have that passion for your business. Because once they lose that passion, then that's when they can go out and start their own thing. And you got to make sure you're giving people the enough incentives to stay with you. And that's kind of something that we were figuring out when we started out as well. So it's, um, I guess, going forward a little bit too. Um, when it comes to training the employees, is there a certain like program you have in place or do you look for people who already have experience uh, in this specific industry? I've tried both routes. Um, the first person that came to work for me was just a close friend of mine. And I was just like, hey, you want to come make some extra money? I'll kind of teach you as I go. And it, it was fun. It was nice. It, it was more like just paying someone so that you had a more fun day at work. It really wasn't more productive or anything. But that kind of taught me early on, okay, if I really want to make money hiring people, I need to hire someone that knows what the heck they're doing. And thankfully for me, I, uh, the girl that first started working for me, she found me and I wasn't even hiring at the time. She just called me out of the blue and was like, hey, I just moved here. I really need a job. And I just started asking her questions that would kind of weed her out if she was a real detailer up to par with what kind of I know like ceramic coatings paint correction or if she was just another car dealership detailer and like I said lucky for me she was great and so she's been with me a little over a year now and uh yeah. awesome yeah no that's awesome. awesome and that's that's one thing that we've learned because all the the gas money guys they're they're contractors so that's like a whole it sounds like you uh your people are w2 employees Mm -hmm. um instead of the contractors so yeah we've had to figure out that fine line between you know giving them education and suggestion instead of full-on you know training this is how you need to do it kind of thing just because that that difference in le legally uh between the employee and the contractor what was your um i guess initial idea when you wanted so was that your your first employee uh the girl that you just talked about or my first official employee i had people come and go that were kind of just not under the table per se i paid them legitimately but like you said 1099 and they did what they wanted with that so right so did that kind of make up your mind uh when obviously as a young business owner we're still doing this it, you learn along the way and a lot of times it's things that you do wrong obviously and you learn like those 1099 uh contractors they they came and go and that's what we have to deal with all the time with our contractors it's you know it's freelance work we can make you the money but the jobs are still coming in so we need to get them done where are you guys at now so with the employee side has that what is that what kind of made your decision to keep people um you know whenever you need them have them sign up as an employee kind of thing Absolutely. instead of being a contractor yeah so the system we had in place before, it was kind of like a pick of the draw thing. I had people submit a form on my website. It would get emailed to me and it was up to whoever took the job to contact them and you would mark it as contacted. And then I would get my cut, you'd get your cut, whatever. 
that was a really inefficient system just because it allowed for way too much leeway on everyone's behalf. It didn't last very long anytime I tried to do it. And I just kind of felt like I need quality employees. And if I want quality employees, I have to be there with them. So for the first while, I would have the girl that works with me now come with me and I would kind of micromanage even though I didn't really need to. She does a good job on her own. Um, but as I got other people, you know, there was a little more training involved, um, just showing them the ropes. And, and I kind of have tiers to it, you know, I have like my level one jobs, my level two jobs, my level three jobs. So then I have my level one, two and three employees. So it all kind of works out with balance like that. Right now, everyone that I have is pretty much fully trained. They know exactly what I know. They've all been previous detailed business owners. And that's really what I looked for whenever I was hiring people. Awesome. And I guess when it comes to building your schedule too, are there any tools that you use, uh, like any softwares or anything? Or um, how do you kind of manage assigning different jobs to different employees and everything like that? Yeah, definitely. That was a big reason why I originally went with doing contractors because I had no, I, I really didn't want to have to manage people's schedules. I had no real knowledge of how to do that. But I guess I kind of worked backwards in a sense because I saw how that worked. And then I was like, OK, so if I was to do it, then this is what I would need. So I looked for softwares that were capable of those things right now. Uh, I'll do a little shout out in case any other detailers watch this best software, hands down. Urable. It is a CRM app, so you can do all your scheduling. You can clock your employees in and out on there. It's also like a virtual store. You can link on your website. People can go on there, select what services they want, add it to their cart, book a specific date and time. They pay a deposit to make sure there's no cancellations. You can enforce whatever type of standard operating procedures, standard policies you'd like. Um, it has inspection documents. It uploads everything that you do on the car to Carfax. It's just it, French kiss. It's amazing. Um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. sweet. Yeah. But yeah, um, software. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say I partner that with Square right now just because, you know, I'm, I believe in the lean startup. It's the cheapest software that, that I know of. But I have my employees go on there and kind of just put their availability each week. And then I schedule my jobs kind of around that. OK, gotcha. so it sounds like you're given a little more control for them to have over their schedule or typically uh, it seems like at least that's a better way to do it from our point of view. And that's what we do with the contractors, which is easy, because there's a lot of times where I mean, if like we have a friend that works at a pizza place, for example, and there will be times where they'll just schedule him when he's not open and it just makes him not want to work there so much more. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess pivoting off this question a little bit, too. So. Obviously, you've been in business for a while. You've been able to learn the ins and outs of the business. And especially in the car detailing market, it's very competitive. So if you want to just explain a little bit more about what it's like, what it's been like establishing that legitimacy for your brand where you can have people with $100,000 cars that come to you and are trusting you to detail their car. I'm sure that was a large process to kind of create that legitimacy. Absolutely. So I like to tell this story just because I think it's kind of unique. The concept for me of establishing the concept of legitimacy for your business, the image of legitimacy for your business, I learned that in school during a history class. We were learning about the mafia and like some of the goals the mafia had for their own businesses. And, I, and in my mind, I was like, well, if they scaled and did it, then maybe this is real. <laughs> so I really focused on that, establishing the image of legitimacy part. You know, I paid a graphic designer to uh, give me input and help me kind of collaborate on my website. I did most of it myself, like the web building part, but the graphic stuff, they helped me with a lot. Um, videos, images, all of that. I, I had a, another person really give me that input because there's not a lot of businesses that are really willing to go the extra mile and invest that in that person, small businesses, I should say. Um, and, and it'll really give you that edge just putting things out there that your competition's not doing, maintaining that image of professionalism um, and just superiority. If you're doing things that your competition's not, people are going to see that. Right. A hundred percent. And with that being said, it sounds like I'm not exactly sure in this, in the car detailing industry, but we know in the service space, um, at least, you know, the, I guess, older people than us that are in the service industries that, you know, residential services, I guess, around homes and things like that. It seems like 
a lot of people, they just think, okay, I'm going to charge this price and I'm going to get paid because I have the experience and I'm not going to do anything else after that. And with that being said, today's day and age, you know, the technology day and age, do you think the software, the um, website, your social media, how much has that come into play? Because technology has helped us in our business extremely. I think it's been our our main thing. I, obviously, we have an app now, um, but we, you know, obviously started with just taking phone calls. And then now it seems like you, you get bookings online and everything. So how has that helped with the technology part? Technology is key, man. I think that all businesses that operated 10, 15, 20 years ago, they're learning now that they have to catch up with the times and really modernize and learn how to adapt with technology because people don't care about word of mouth as much. A lot of people don't have reference for word of mouth. So a lot of people are going to go on Google best blah, blah, blah in town and look you up. And it's about at that point, your SEO, your Google reviews, how you've optimized your Google profile, things that you have to do as a business owner. And it almost has nothing to do with your services. I can go on Google right now and find businesses that I know are garbage. <laughs> they pay marketing people to boost their profiles and they look great. And that's how they still fool people into thinking, yeah, we should go here. And usually it's going to be larger corporations, unfortunately. but. Exactly. And yeah, we saw on your Facebook, we were looking through earlier, like you have around like 750 likes and follows and then over 50 reviews. So for those reviews, I mean, is that something where you like it would encourage people if they enjoyed their experience to leave one or was that mostly organic? Because that's one of the best things that you can get, especially on social media is those positive reviews. Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that Urable does, it actually whenever you mark a job as complete after 24 hours of marking it complete, it'll send a text message to the client asking them to leave you a Google review. Funny enough, so I, I don't know if I told you all this earlier, I actually have another detail business that I have, might not make much sense, but the, the Google reviews for everything I do go to that business. So everything you see on Facebook and Google for Coast to Coast, that's all organic. I haven't asked anybody for it, it hasn't sent them a link, they just took it upon themselves to look me up and leave me that review. But that's awesome. For the uh, Seminole Mobile, detailing business the other side of it yeah that's all yeah yeah we were gonna I ask did. about that because yeah, we saw, I saw so that. on coast to coast it looks like um, when you go to the yearable site then that's where it becomes seminal detailing mm -hmm. um so is it basically like same employees same structure or is it uh, two completely separate businesses so i kind of do that for the marketing side of it you know I, one of the things that i wanted to talk to you all about was like marketing as a high value service and attracting high value clients it's really hard to do that whenever ceramic coatings paint correction the high-end tickets it they almost don't even fall under the same scope of what most detailers do if you look up detailing tallahassee or detailing anywhere most of what you find they're not going to be real ceramic coating installers they're not going to be real sort of well, there's no certification they're not going to be really qualified to do paint correction um so one way that i kind of found that i can distinguish that i have seminal mobile which is more marketed towards people just looking to have their car cleaned or maintained or whatever then i have coast to coast which is like the higher end co um, ceramic coatings and all that i think in 2019 you know 2020 i added the ceram or coast to coast detailing and ceramic coatings i added the last part then just so i can kind of distinguish the two but the employees um, everybody's cross-trained. It's just one of those where when someone books a regular job, it's a seminal mobile job. When someone books a coding or a paint correction, it's a coast to coast job. Yeah. Awesome. And I guess relating to Seminole too, like for those who are listening, who aren't familiar with Florida state, that's our, that's our mascot. That's our logo um, associated with the Seminole tribe of Florida. Go Noles. Eight no right now this football season. But, um, I guess going more into that kind of like student entrepreneur aspect, obviously you were taking some classes on entrepreneurship, learning a lot about what it takes to run a business. Um, what was that process like or how did that feel for you to be going to college, one of the best schools in the country and also running a business at the same time? I, I can't lie, man. It was the best feeling in the world. Um, I would wake up every morning and just feel like I really made it because the whole reason I even started my business was to make it here to Florida State. And just having the blessing of being here and waking up every morning, looking outside. Y'all can't see my view, but I'm looking at the stadium right now. That's what I see outside every morning. Really? That's um, sweet. 
it's just the most motivational thing and it just really reminds me hey this is what you did this for yeah exactly yeah. and i guess even going further too uh, obviously i met you we were at a local bar in tallahassee um just there, there's so many ways to meet people here at college and that's what i love the most because austin and i come from a small town in michigan um, great community, great town, but there's not as many people, obviously, especially when we're in Tallahassee in the capital, huge college town. So throughout your years of college, I mean, did you find any great mentors through that? Any great connections? Like what was your experience like in networking and just meeting as many people as possible? Absolutely. So I think once, so I actually was majoring in interdisciplinary social sciences and uh, it wasn't until like my last two years at Florida State that I actually even found out about the entrepreneurship program my uh advisor was like why aren't you doing this and i was like that's a thing so <laughs> but once i decided to minor in it because there wasn't enough time to change my major um i every professor i had in the entrepreneurship program just had indefinitely valuable advice you know um they were crucial role models that i needed at the time to kind of restructure and realign myself with how i need to be as a businessman because Sure, I know other people who own businesses, but not a lot that have been successful enough to the point that they can now teach an entrepreneurship class. Yeah, exactly. Right. Which is which is huge. I mean, that's what we figured out. Obviously, you can network, you can know a lot of people, but if those people, you know, haven't, I guess, gotten as far as what you can look up to them and and you know have a conversation you can look up to this person and actually understand they they're giving credible and tested and experience um tested experience i guess you could say and everything they're telling you that's that's the best network to have is really being able to look up to somebody and also like get that motivation and believe what they're telling you and then implement that uh or you know the grains of salt that you get from that conversation into what you're doing and with that too so obviously rob and i were co-founders um this we started this square one like it's not like i joined later he joined later or anything like that did you ever have anybody else um that's been with you along the way either a co-founder or you know a family member or a, a mentor that's really been direct with everything because it's it's got to be really difficult you know being that that one man show yeah definitely you know i've made acquaintances along the way that kind of do the same thing as me. I've joined Facebook groups online for detailing and met other people around the globe, even within 20 miles of me that I just made great friends with. And just having those guys along the ride, kind of starting from the same space, it was fun to kind of collaborate and bounce ideas off one another. Obviously I have my family too, you know, but as far as expanding and growing on the detail side, learning more on that, you have to surround yourself with other people that are immersed in that. Um, it, it's been fun to see who started at the same time as me and grew at the same pace as me or even more rapidly than me because those are the people that I've really tried to take information from. Exactly. And I guess talking about growth and scale, like what are your long term goals? I mean, if you had like a five year plan from now, where would you want to be with uh, coast to coast? Are you trying to uh, eventually scale at coast to coast or I mean, what's your plan with that and how far would you like to go? Yeah. So initially, the idea of coast to coast is kind of a, a not accurate name, but the coast I was referring to was the Gulf Coast to the Atlantic coast of Florida but um, I was gonna do Pensacola to either Jacksonville or if that went well enough, maybe Pensacola to Miami, but I don't think that's gonna happen. I've gotten a little more realistic over the years and I just don't really have that in my endeavor anymore. I think that where my heart lies now, I'd like to really build up coast to coast and Seminole for what it is here in Tallahassee and uh, obviously have employees that can kind of sustain a long-term program where it never dissipates, but I'd eventually like to kind of go do other things. My, I really want to be a teacher. That's what I initially went to school for, but I had the business at the same time. And just with everything going on, not just politically, but, you know, with COVID and whatnot, I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to be a teacher right now. Um, yeah. And also just because I'm young, you know, like there's you're only young and capable of doing so many things while you're young. So don't waste that time when you can be a teacher anytime, I guess. 
Yeah, and that's something Austin and I talk about too. And it's perfect because our main tar- target audience for gas money for this podcast is like young adults, either in high school, college, the trades, the military, who are uh, just trying to figure out some guidance and and mentorship for life. And maybe they don't have access to that in their current situation or whatever their situation may be. I think one of the best things that you just brought up too is we're still really young. I mean, how old are you? 26. 26. So yeah, we're 21 or I'm 21, Austin's 22. So it's funny looking back when I was in high school, I thought we had to have everything figured out by now. And a lot of people push that on you. But realistically, like we're we're still obviously working on the business. We want to grow this as far as we can. Our goal is one day to be nationwide, which would be awesome. Um, obviously good to set big goals. But at the same time, I mean, one of the best things about being young is you can make mistakes, you can make, uh, you can have failures, and you can bounce back from them. Whereas once you get older, uh, it might not be as easy to bounce back. So I guess just kind of relating it to that motivational aspect, especially for young adults, are there any big mistakes you've made or failures that you've had where making that mistake allowed you to learn something that actually propelled you further forward? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that just what I valued myself as early on, um, I didn't see the bigger picture in longevity. I always was like, like I said earlier, I was the cheap detail guy. I didn't really care about um, scaling my business or taking it to the point where I am now. And my biggest regret is that I didn't try to invest in myself more back then because I, I had every opportunity to. I just didn't do it. And if I did it back then, who knows where I'd be today? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's the thing. We've we've definitely looked at every every, I guess, pitfall or I hate the word failure. We we look at every, you know, failure or thing that didn't work out as as a lesson and a piece of advice that you should take every time. So you don't do it again, obviously. And sometimes it does happen multiple times, but um we try to really push ourselves forward with all the things that you know didn't work out and you gotta come up with a a new math problem and try to figure that one out but to keep yourself going and like obviously being an entrepreneur this is not meant for everybody um owning a business all that stuff it's it's meant for the the right people that can either self-motivate or also motivate you know you have employees and keep people going like that do you read any books do you listen to podcasts do you uh i guess what what keeps pushing you along yeah, definitely. Um, I mentioned those Facebook groups earlier that I'm a part of um, with other detailers that kind of give me insight into where, where they're at. I would say it's been more of like just learning and reading from their experiences, um, watching YouTube videos and podcasts that they've put together to kind of educate myself, not just on detailing stuff, but also business stuff. There's been a lot of really valuable lessons there. Um, I, I definitely don't read as much as I should. I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that, but I, I feel us, like us I, take, either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I take it in a lot more just hearing it straight from the horse's mouth. And I've met a lot and I mean a lot of people who've run businesses and just hearing their stories, their successes, their failures, where they've fallen short, things they wish they knew. I, I feel like that's been an invaluable source of knowledge that books just can't replicate. I, I have a, a customer back home in Pensacola. He's got a tree care business. Um, I, I think he's given me some of the best business advice I've ever received. And it may be that he does trees, but the things that he's taught me, you can apply to any business. It's more in your dealings with people, your dealings with your money, your dealings with your finances. It was like a miniature accounting class that I took with him. And I was like, dang, I never thought of that. And it's all about leveraging how you save your money, how you organize your business as an LLC or an S Corp, that kind of thing. And then obviously, like I said, I went to school at Florida State later on and got even more in tune with that kind of thing, got more of an education around that. But yeah, those are the kind of things that a lot of people who start their businesses they'll be in business 20, 30 years and never have even heard the word S Corp. They have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, And that's one of those things we always talk about is when we started, we were fortunate enough to have mentors that knew about business. And if it wasn't for them, I'm not sure if we would have ever actually established an LLC. Like we had no idea what that was, no idea how to do taxes or anything. 
And although it was a pretty hard learning process with the help of the mentors, the first time we did it, it was pretty difficult. Then the second year came along, got easier and easier. And uh, now it's one of those things where like, we were big advocates for learning through experience. And one of the best ways you can learn through experience if you don't have experience is by learning from somebody else who has more experience in that sector. So that's one of the things we always try and uh, advocate on the podcast is like, don't be afraid to reach out to people. And I know you mentioned when you're at the Jim Rand College here at Florida State uh, Entrepreneurship College, um, you talk to professors, like reach out to them. I'm sure it was like either after, after class or like office hours. And that's what a lot of people don't realize is like, especially in business, um, those people that have been through it already, that have already been successful or had failures with their business, those are the best people to talk to. And they're also the most like willing to talk to you about it. So I guess one of our things we always push is like, don't be afraid to reach out, whoever is listening to this, because obviously in your experience, that was where you got a lot of advice from. And a lot of times these people, they're just, they're looking to help out. I mean, they were in your shoes once too. So. I agree with that. Yeah, I think man. the most successful people are going to be more inclined to help. If they're, if, if someone's too busy for you or they don't want to help you, they're, they're probably not really as big as they seem they are. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they might be putting on a show. Exactly. Which that's the unfortunate truth about because um, obviously with those Facebook groups, you probably figured out like this is definitely legit after the conversations and things like that. But it's so sad to see on social media, you know, the ads of um, a lot of like e-commerce stuff, I guess. You see like all the e-commerce people and, you know, how to make twenty thousand dollars a week and this is what i did and i'm like man like the way that they put it oh it's that easy okay come on you know but it's it's uh that's that's the truth with social media um with all that stuff and you combine business with it you know uh gary v i don't know if you've ever heard of gary vaynerchuk but he's you know controversial some people love him some people hate him but he did have a pretty good truth um, about social media and it's kind of the scary truth is that, you know, social media has kind of made entrepreneurship look like really, really cool and easy, I guess. Uh, just some of the, you know, some of the videos that I've seen and it's like, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a lot harder. It's cool. Trust me. I love it. I love all entrepreneurs in business, but it's definitely not for everybody. And I think that's what, unfortunately, um, you know, some of the things online have made it uh, seem a little easier than than what it actually is. I don't know if you kind of relate. It's definitely not that easy, right? 100%, man. I think that people undersell how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur in today's day and age all the time. I, I think there's situations where people are blessed and don't realize how blessed they are. And that's why it's so easy for them. Maybe they got a really hefty angel investment early on or whatever it may be that's right. just enabled them to be that much more ahead of the game than everybody else. But when you're really starting from ground roots, man, it's hard. Um, but yeah. I, I agree with everything you said hundred percent. And you were talking yeah. about Gary V. I, I love Gary V, man. I know that just like you said, a lot of people, you either hate or hate them or you love them. But uh, I, talking earlier about entrepreneurs that are willing to help other entrepreneurs, I think he's the, golden boy example <laughs> exactly yeah no, i think so too um i guess a little bit of a pivot and i i know we're kind of getting up maybe close to an hour 40 minutes or so but um so i saw on your website at the bottom you said you might have a vlog coming soon that's i don't know i don't know if you want to explain <laughs> anything about that if that's like a thing that you don't want to you know talk about publicly yet or anything like that but that's cool stuff because we do uh on the job vlogs and it's super fun you know that's been a dream of mine to do that for a long time now i think right around the era of content creation being monetized was whenever i first had that idea but it's just been something that i've just never really had the time for it's been on my website i think three years now and uh i've made no progress toward it i hate to say it but I think oh, it's man. mostly because I'm still trying to get the structure there. And also just because I'm still such an active employee in my business. My biggest goal for 2024 is to quit being an employee and start being an owner, a manager, just so I can improve the internal structure. Because whenever you're a part of it and you're doing it every day, it really taints your perspective of what needs to happen. And you cut corners no matter what you do. It doesn't matter how good of a work ethic you have something's going to get left out, whether it be 
how you invest back into your business, how you're doing the job day in and day out, something. Yeah, honestly, that's how we were too. Like, we still are kind of transitioning a little bit away because especially if you're passionate about it, it's fun like to go out and do jobs and stuff. And then you lose sight of, I'm supposed to be kind of managing a little more than I am right now and stuff like that. And then I guess I'm um, just kind of relating back to what you said about the, the vlogs. Like if we had advice, like it would be just try and at least do one and then yeah. do a couple more after that because we, um, it was one of those things like we were trying to wait to get like a good mic set up or a good camera. And then finally I was just like, dude, like next time we go on the job, let's just pull out the phone and start recording stuff here and there. And like one of the videos that we posted got like over like a hundred views in less than a day, which is like, we only have like 13 subscribers on YouTube. So we were like, man, like that got some good organic reach. So yeah. it's one of those things too. That's cool. Like you can look back, kind of see your progress as you grew throughout the business and now more than ever like obviously it's a huge world of short form content mostly but even like long term um there's a lot of people out there on youtube who like to just go and see what it's like like a day in the life of running a mobile detailing business I'm yeah sure be stuff like that so yeah if, if we had a word of advice and we got to get more consistent too that's one of the biggest things with content is like it's easy to do here and there when you have that time set aside, but when you're busy, especially like you are, like we are, it's uh, it's really tough to be consistent, and that's really what you need to do if you want those results. So, is that one of those things? Like, as like I know you mentioned, 2024, you kind of want to be that more managerial guy, more the owner role. Is that something that you want to start incorporating a little more, or you can kind of uh, maybe figure that out later on? Yeah, I definitely think that's something I want to start incorporating more. You know, I, I want to be I want to have less hats to wear just so that I can kind of focus more on all of the things that I've been striving for for so long, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure you could find a way too to kind of combine that educational aspect. Like you love teaching people. That's one of your goals where maybe you're in business long enough. You you uh, obviously still maintain ownership of the business or keep it going but you could almost uh pivot a little bit and start doing like what it takes to run a multi detailing business explain all of your experiences like that's what's cool about entrepreneurship is we always have like thousands of ideas just pop into our head of like ways that um you can go in there ways that you can go and i'm sure you're the same way just like kind of fighting every problem and trying to look for a solution for it absolutely i i think that uh something that I really want for myself, whenever I said earlier, I want to be a teacher, I really want to teach entrepreneurship but to some capacity. I'd like to teach something for people with service-based business ideas. Cause I found that at Florida state, there was a lot for product-based businesses, but for people around service-based businesses, there really wasn't much. And I know it's kind of a more niche side of um, entrepreneurship, but I think it's very important because there's things you can't really teach, but you can try and kind of lead people to believe like the importance of work ethic, the importance of building your brand early on, that kind of thing. And I, I think there wasn't much emphasis for that. Thankfully, I just had good teachers that personally knew what I was doing. So after class, you know, they would talk with me and they check in with me and be like, how are you doing with this? What are you doing with that? And even just having that just invigorating thought process, it really gives you direction on where to go. And I could see how that would be really useful for people. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I guess just one, uh, one more quick question. I was curious cause I keep, uh, we keep talking, you know, mobile detailing, mobile detailing. So is that literally, you know, you go to the client's house every time and you don't like have, have a shop or do you, like, how does that work? Like, what's what's the define mobile detailing, I guess? Yeah, <laughs> totally. So mobile detailing, I, I go to the client um, anytime that I'm able to do it without using their power or water, I will. But I, I usually try to just because, again, lean overhead. It's a lot easier. I'm not going to buy three compressors, three generators for my employees right. so that they can use and abuse it. It's a lot more sustainable to just have an extension cord and use their power, their water, you know? Um, sure. but I also do have a shop. Um, right now I'm just kind of operating out of my house just because we're about to buy another house. So I'm trying to cut some costs in some places. Um, when I was in Pensacola, I was kind of renting a space for a little bit, but it really just didn't get enough use there. I wasn't really, um, I had just begun to push the ceramic coatings and paint correction back then. So 
and more of my business lies here in Tallahassee these days. So, and real estate for shops out here is a lot more expensive. <laughs> yeah. So I'm that's sure. more of the, you know, the, the more specialized, the ceramic coating, that stuff, that's what you would have to do back at like a shop. You couldn't just do that in the, the client's driveway or is I it... do that in their driveway as well. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I'm sorry, not in their driveway, in their garage. If they don't have a garage, right. I have, then I'm like, are you opposed to dropping it off with me? I have a garage, you know, and most of the time they're okay with it. Usually if they're looking for a ceramic coating, they're okay with that. It's not so much the mobile component. If they're just wanting their car cleaned up, they usually want you to come to them. So that's right. where I think that uh, at least here in Tallahassee, I don't I don't want to speak on every market because I'm not there, but I think that detailing facilities aren't very uh, plentiful because not many people want to drop their cars off places. Most people I yeah. know don't take their car to the mechanic. They just let it drive with the check engine light on forever. <laughs> exactly. No, yeah. it's, it's crazy. And uh, I guess one more question about the, the business aspect of it too. Like what's the insurance look like? Um, Cause that's one of the things we had to figure out having a service business. It's kind of different with the insurance because obviously there's a lot more liability, especially if you're um, working on very expensive cars. So was that something that was uh, like, I guess difficult to figure out at first? Uh, did you learn from mentors and like also just how I'm sure it's expensive. Like you don't have to get into the details of it, but it's gotta be, <laughs> It's got to be pretty expensive. It's definitely pricey. Um, yeah. I'll put it this way, though. I have a great insurance agent. That man, I, he, he he deserves the world. Um, I A lot of my friends kind of told me, oh, you need this insurance. And then you go talk to an insurance agent and they say, no, you need this insurance. And it's really hard, depending on what business you're in, to know exactly what insurance you need. So that's why I always say, just talk to your broker, ask them what you need, what you're trying to cover, what you're trying to protect yourself against. Personally, I think a lot of people end up under protecting themselves. Even the people that do have insurance, they don't realize just how bad people can come after them. So I don't just have business insurance. I have a personal umbrella policy for myself so that if anything ever were to exceed the value of what my business is and they come for me personally, I'm 100% protected. My, my insurance guy and I have a joke. I told him if I, I want to be able to go punch someone in the face and be completely insured against it. And he's like, I got that. <laughs> he's got you go. covered. <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's, that's smart though. It's better to be, obviously, you know, if you just look at price, it's, you know, it's easy to, to short yourself and just be like, ah, I can probably just, you know, get by with this. But at the end of the day, I feel like in any service, no matter how simple or complex, well, I guess how simple it, it is, you want to be covered. And um, from a business standpoint, that's what, that's what we we figured out, not the hard way. Uh, knock on wood, obviously. We still haven't haven't had anything too bad happen, but it just, it, you never know, um, yeah. especially when it's not just you now, you have the employees as well. So you, at the end of the day, you have to make sure if there's a job going on that you're not there. It's also peace of mind, you know, that, that uh, you're not going to be fully worried the entire time and sweating, hoping that the job is done well and, and, you know, nobody hurt anything or got hurt. So that's, uh, that's huge. And was that like a, just kind of like an intuition you were like, I need to make sure that everything is covered or was that a lot of advice from, uh, the insurance guy? A little bit of both. Um, I have a really close friend from back home. He actually used to be my boss. Um, he ended up going on and selling insurance after that. And just seeing all his posts, it really educated me on the dangers of not having insurance or even worse, being underinsured. Um, I, I think that that planted the seed early on. So I always try to have something to cover myself. But whenever I got employees, I was like, OK, it's not just a game anymore. I have to have the best of the best because I'm not going to sleep at night. I'm a very anxious person when it comes to worrying about other people <laughs> exactly it's it's definitely oh, worth the peace of mind to to be legit and that's like when we started out too uh at first it was just kind of like we weren't even aware that we were running like an entrepreneurial thing it was more of like a side hustle trying to make money and then once we started growing we were like all right like now it's time to get insurance we got to make an llc and um it's it's pretty overwhelming at first but if you talk to the right people and uh, you have that that urgency to get that peace of mind it's definitely worth it to, to go out there and get that so recommend that to anybody and uh yeah i guess looking at the time we're about an hour here it's been great conversations 
And we always ask a good question at the end. Um, it's very, very broad, very general. Um, but if you could give one piece of advice to any aspiring entrepreneur who's a young adult out there, what would that be? Train your mind to take risks. Um, go out of your comfort zone. Put your fears behind you and always put your best foot forward. All decisions have consequences, but there's no consequence more painful than uh, missing out on a great opportunity due to skepticism or fear. Exactly. I like that. Gotta, I like that. Yeah. You got to take the risk. It's, uh, if you don't go for it, you'll never know. There's a good quote that actually relates to that. Um, it goes, you'll regret the things that you don't do more than the things that you do. So kind of relating that to what you said. If you have an idea out there, go for it. If you fail, the only thing that's going to hurt you is not learning from that experience. So if you do fail, you'll learn from that experience. Keep going from there. And uh, also, too, uh, go ahead and uh, shout out your website, shout out your Facebook. Where can people find you at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, coast to coast LLC.com. That's the number two, coast to coast. Um, Facebook.com C to C detailing. Well, forward slash C to C detailing. Um, Instagram, we're also C to C detailing on there. Perfect. And then do you have a number or do you mostly do just the online appointments? Uh, whatever. Yeah. Call me anytime. 850 723 9743. There you go. Awesome. awesome. We had awesome. so much for coming on today. Yeah. I appreciate you guys. It's been a been a pleasure. Yeah. Like awesome. we always say uh, at the end of our podcast, go get that gas money. Gas money. <laughs> <laughs>